glad to, he to be here and uh, to present on Go uh, in my home country for once. Um, so this is a little bit of a semi-formal, more informal presentation. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask right away. Uh, it's also a presentation I've uh, put together over the last couple of weeks only. Uh, and it's intended as, as a, an open. So before I start, um, who of you has already heard of Go or never heard of Go? Let's start with who has never heard of Go? Okay, who has, who has uh, heard of Go and even written code in Go? One person, okay. Good, so I, I guess I should dive in a little bit more into details. So <clears throat> let's start with uh, a little bit of history. So what is Go? It's a programming language, it's not a board game. Uh, it comes with a lot of documentation. In the meantime, also lots of books. There is libraries and a lot of great tools. And most importantly, at this point, there's a very vibrant open source community. This is an open source project. It has started almost 10 years ago. In fact, uh, September 20th or 21st, I think we started <laughs> years ago. And uh, as Mik Michele uh, alluded to, it's a 20% project, which is like this fabled concept that we have at Google where every engineer can take 20% of their time and do whatever they want, which is not really true. Uh, it's more like if you are burning to do something and you cannot be held back from doing that no matter what, even if you have a day job and you still do it at night uh, and you can convince your manager that this is something that might perhaps eventually see the fruit of the light of day, he might allocate some time and give you some time so that you can actually pursue it uh, as part of your day job. Okay, but it's not, it's not true that every, every Google engineer just automatically gets 20% time to do whatever they want. So the project started uh, with three people, eventually grew to five people. And the goal was really to find a replacement, not a replacement, sorry, a alternative to the C++ programming languages. C++ is the most commonly used programming language inside Google next to Java and then a whole slew of other languages. Um, and uh, many of us have been programming in C++ for lots of many, many years. I've, I've been programming in C++ for 10 plus years and we were sort of tired and fed up with it. And we thought that there's, there must be better ways of doing things, especially in the 21st century. You know, the programming language should not be the problem. It should be the problem that you're trying to solve. So that's how Go started. Um, eventually, in 2009, it became an open source project. We open sourced it. Um, and in 2012, we froze it. And what that means is we decided that we're not going to change the language in any incompatible ways, and we're not going to change the libraries in any backward incompatible ways. It didn't mean we wouldn't change that. We wouldn't make small changes or fixes or add new stuff, but we would guarantee that whatever was there would always be there, at least for the foreseeable future. And that was really the, probably the most important decision once Go was out, to actually freeze it. That's when all the other people outside in the world, companies, startups, etc., started to jump on the bandwagon and actually use it because they, they, they knew they could rely on it. <clears throat> And we've uh, been doing this ever since. Uh, we have now a semi-annual release cycle, and in fact, just uh, four days ago, we released uh, one, version 1 1.9. So that's where we are now. Uh, Go 1.9 was released last week. Uh, if you look at some statistics that you can find on Stack Overflow, it's the uh, fifth most loved and third most wanted language. It's the number 14 on Stack Overflow in terms of languages used. It's number nine of languages on GitHub, and it's the second fastest growing. Uh, it's number nine in IEEE rankings. And we estimate between 500,000 to a million uh, users, programmers, but you know, that's, that's really hard to uh, get a good, good grip, grip on this. And it's used all over the place. So obviously there's places like Google, but also IBM, Microsoft, Uber, Dell, all the big tech companies that you'd expect. Uh, but then also companies like the New York Times, BBC, 
and, but also Amazon, Walmart, and especially in China, it's one of the largest growing languages. We see companies like Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei, Baidu, etc., having large numbers of engineers, I mean, but, you know, still small compared to the size of these companies, but definitely uh, significant numbers of engineers working in Go and actually doing products in Go that, that serve real traffic. So if you want to see a little bit more about where Go is in the world and where we are, I, I highly recommend this presentation, The State of the Go for Nation by Steve Francia. He gave that last week at the Go conference in uh, London. Uh, and it's a much, it's a, it's a little bit more fun and more, perhaps more sales oriented presentation, but it gives you a very good idea of how Go uh, looks like in the world, where, where it stands in the world. So every, every you know, real project needs a gopher, and you know, I, I think, I don't know how many percent of the success we have to attribute to the gopher, but uh, this is our mascot, and this is the one version, it comes in a couple of other versions, very popular, and there's vinyl versions, and printed versions, and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about the technology. <clears throat> so I talked, uh, about the, the language. So this is a general purpose programming language. It's uh, compact, concise, and readable. What do I mean by this? So compact, it's a small language. Uh, you can read the spec. That I really mean like the actual technical definition of the language in a couple of hours easily. It's quite readable. It doesn't feel like a you know, C++ reference. Uh, the language is concise. There's no public, static, void main. You just say function main or func main, that's it. And we put a lot of emphasis on readability. So code is most often read, more often read than written, and so we really want people to be able to read the code. And uh, you will see that there are some, some of the examples that it, more, it looks more like pseudocode than what you would maybe, or some people would consider like you know, software. Uh, it's a strongly typed language without the typing, so it's in the tradition of the strongly typed com uh, compiled languages, but you don't have to write a lot of type information down. In fact, most of the cases you don't have to write type information down at all, and some of it is so deduced. It's a garbage collected language, but it doesn't have the pause times that usually are associated with garbage collected languages. And we've, our garbage collection team has made some enormous progress in that in that space. And I'm talking here, uh, you know, sub-millisecond pauses for very, very large heaps. And finally, it's a scalable and concurrent and efficient language. So the, this language was designed specifically for large-scale programming development. Uh, think Google, Google style. Uh, so there is an organization into packages. There's tools that uh, can deal with dependencies dependency analysis, uh, compilers are fast. It's a concurrent language, it's automatic, it supports concurrency in the language in a very, very simple way. And it's efficient, it's compiled to uh, machine code, it uh, runs on a variety of platforms, and it's probably best compared to C. It's, if you will, you can think of, of Go as a you know, modern C. Uh, syntactically, it has C tokens, so you know you see curly braces and things like that. But it has Pascal structure, so types are written from left to right as opposed to inside out, which makes it, which makes them much easier to read. So I don't really have time to go into the details of the language, but I'm going to give you a bunch of examples that pick out some of the things that I think might be interesting to you. So. Here are a bunch of declarations. Every program in Go consists of essentially five declarations. Import declarations, which are declarations of packages you depend on, constant, variable, and type declarations, and function declarations. That's it. There's something interesting about constant declarations in Go. They are actually represented uh, mathematically precise inside the compiler. So if you write down a, num a numeric constant like pi, you can write down you know, 50 digits and the compiler will maintain those 50 digits and it will actually do accurate, mathematically precise computation 
to those 50 or more digits actually when you when you use those constants so pi divided by 2 will still be that precise so especially when you write numerical code you're not you don't need to write down uh, you know this is now a uh, a double long floating point number or a double long integer or whatever you have and then constantly keep in your head uh, what kind of type it is constants if you don't give them a type are untyped and they can again be arbitrarily precise so for instance the sixth value here this is really one over six inside the compiler and if you <coughs> multiply that later by six again you get one back as a constant so that's it's kind of a small thing and for the programmer it sort of falls by the wayside you actually almost don't notice but it's enormous when you actually write code because you never have to think about stuff, stuff like that then you have variable declarations of course with initializations and so forth there's complex numbers uh, type declarations and you can see the structure is like in Pascal so you have a keyword you have a, the name of the type and you have a um, you know not a Pascal record but a struct C struct and we have very powerful composite literal uh, constructors so you can create things like this uh, you don't need to write functions to create those things the same is true for arrays and maps and, and things like that so it has a very scripty feel so statements is more C like but in contrast to C there's only five binary precedence levels so you can actually keep them in your head you don't have to put in parentheses just because you're not sure if it needs one or not um, we got rid of extra parentheses around if statements and stuff uh, we got rid of semicolons where we could but we made curly braces mandatory and so as a result an if statement looks more like this so no no parentheses around the condition but these curly braces are always present and we allow initialization expressions in an if statement same as they are already in a for statement same as there and you can also do them in switch statements uh, we have parallel assignment so if you say x comma y equals y comma x that's a true parallel assignment this that swaps actually the two values it's kind of useful uh, switch has been fixed so you can write things like this the break is implicit um, you know common sense things that were clearly uh, I, I would say broken and see. So there is functions, of course. They look like this. Here is a simple um, function that computes a minimum. They are first class objects, so they're closures. Um, so you would write you could write a, flo a closure like this here without the body, assign it to a variable f. And we have a very clean handling of variadic signatures. It's built into the language. There's no macro stuff going on here. And inside this function, you can access these arguments as if they were like part of an array or slice. Uh, there, is, there is an easy way of declaring a new variable, assign, and giving it a type and assigning a value to it here. We see x is declared as a new variable and it gets the type of this function result and is initialized to the value that this function gives you. And so this is one of the small but powerful things that make Go so easy to use because you can declare variables very quickly, you don't need to write down a type, uh, and you get everything there in, in, with a few keystrokes. So I tried to find some you know, numerical application. So here's a mathematical um, um, uh, matrix multiplication. Of course, this is like not how you do matrix multiplication uh, in your field. I'm aware of that. This is like a textbook you know, mul multiplication where you just have these three loops and iterate through it. But um, um, <clears throat> I want to show a few things here. So Go is an object-oriented language, but it's not object-oriented in the same way as, you'd say, Java is or you know, other languages. There's no classes, um, there's no uh, subclasses, there's no inheritance, things like that. What we have is we have two concepts. We have the concept of methods and we have the concept of interfaces. A method is simply a function that has a receiver. And so here we have a function 
call at, and it has a, an argument that is before the function name here, and that is the receiver. Uh, some of you may have heard of Oberon, one of the last languages that Niklas worked on. Uh, Oberon 2 had exactly this kind of notation, and that's where it's coming from. And what this means is that this is now a function or a, a method that is bound to this type. And so inside this function, you have access to, you know, of course, this matrix via this additional parameter here. And this is statically bound. So it's, there's no difference between a function and a method in terms of ex execution at this point. This is simply a notational convenience. And it allows you to call this function via a method call. Um, I've not said that in the beginning, but Go has not been designed with you know, scientific computation uh, in focus. So there are some things that, from a scientific computation point of view, you might find lacking. And I'm, I'm going to address this a little bit, or trying to address this a little bit. Specifically, there is no multidimensional matrices. There is, there is very strong support for one-dimensional growable uh, arrays, which we call slices, but not for two-dimensional things. And so one way one can work around this is by actually implementing an accessor yourself. So that's what I've done here. And then I've written a matrix multiplication in terms of this accessor here. So um, I'm just calling this function or method and calling this method. And the equal, this is the equivalent of, the, of, of this statement if you have that kind of access. So, Again, coming from the C tradition, it's not something that's there automatically. So, <clears throat> object orientation is achieved by the concept of an interface. An interface is a type that simply defines some methods. So this is very similar to what you might see in Java and other programming languages. But the difference here is that you don't have to specify um, first this interface implements another other interface or this type implements this interface. The, the connection is implicit. Basically, if you define a type that has a certain set of methods and if those methods happen to satisfy the method of an interface, then that type satisfies that interface. So here is a very simple example again. So here's an interface that defines a new method string that produces a string. And now, if I'm going back to the matrix type that I had before, if I define a method string on that matrix type, then I can <coughs> assign this matrix type M, a value of that matrix type M, to a variable of type stringer, even though you know, these are different types. This is an interface, this is a matrix type, but this matrix type has the same method string as the interface type, and so I can do the assignment. And then I can call x.string, and in this situation here, this is the place where dynamic dispatch happens. So this is the string method that belongs to the type that was stored in x, so it's a matrix. If I, tie, if I store something else in there, then you know, the corresponding string method of that type will be invoked. That's really all there is, and it turns out it's incredibly powerful. And um, in contrast to other languages, we cannot just give methods to records or you know, classes. You can give methods to any type. You can define any type and give it methods. Could it be even an integer type or a floating point type? And finally, there is concurrency. <clears throat> so in Go, there is two concepts. One is the concept of a Go routine, and one is the concept of a channel. And uh, we call the coroutines Go routines, of course. And a Go routine is being launched by the keyword Go. So if you have the keyword Go followed by an ordinary function call, then this function is going to be launched as a Go routine and it's going to run concurrently with whatever else you have running. Specifically in this case, it would be running concurrently with the code that launched. And at that point, the, that thing is out of your direct control. 
And that's all you need to do. It's really, it's really technically just a coroutine. Now, once you have a coroutine launched, of course you want to communicate with that coroutine and that's where channels come into play. A channel is a type, you write down like this, channel of T. T can be anything. It can be a struct, an integer, you know, whatever we want, a string. And channels are essentially pipes. Think of it as a Unix pipe. You can send to a channel and you can receive from a channel. And when you send to a channel, the channel is blocking until somebody on the other side receives. And vice versa, if you receive from a channel, it is blocking until somebody actually sends. And so that's where synchronization happens. And so if you have multiple, you know, thousands typically of coroutines launched, then they are usually communicating through channels. Uh, so here's an example of how that would look like. So you, you would create a new channel. It's a channel of integers. And so this is the statement that sends the value 1 to that channel. And if, if nobody is reading from this channel somewhere else concurrently, then this statement will be blocking. And here again, here you're receiving from the channel and store the value in the variable x. And again, if nobody is sending on that channel at the same time, then you will be blocking. So channels are a way of communicating. And uh, Rob Pike, who is one of the uh, co-creators of Go, has this uh, famous quote here. He said, don't communicate by sharing memory. Share memory by communicating. So the, the idea is really that when you have to communicate across several go routines, that you should use a channel to signal this piece of memory. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to send all the data over the, over the channel, because that would be an expensive operation. But it's, it's enough to signal over a channel that now this data is, for instance, ready. And then another coroutine has access to that. Uh, it's important maybe to say that there is no protection of that memory. So there's no, there's no, it's not like an Erlang process where once you launch another process, that process is basically um, walled off and you have no access to it. And the reason is because we want to be efficient. And this turns out actually to be a paradigm that works extre extremely well. So in Go, uh, a Go routine uses very little memory. I think it's 4K. So it's no problem on a, on a modern laptop to launch a million Go routines in less than a second. And it's easy to communicate between them. It's, it's very, very, very efficient. So I'm. I'm uh, <coughs> taking this and I'm going to go back to the matrix multiplication example and exploring this a little bit. <coughs> so I rewrote this uh, function before a little bit. Uh, it's still not you know, what you would write, what you guys would write, but it's perhaps a little bit better. So instead of doing my three loops here, I now replace the inner loop with a dot product between a row and a column. But I also want to access the data in the memory in row major order because memory is stored in row major order. So uh, I take the first matrix, that's A, and then I take the second matrix and transpose it, so that's T. And I create a new matrix for the result, that's C. And then I'm going to iterate over the A rows, and I'm iterating over the T rows, which is to transpose the B matrix, and then I just do the dot product. Okay. So that's your. Uh, new matrix multiplication is not using concurrency. And now I made an experiment. It's literally a five minute experiment here. Uh, I took this piece of code and I wrote it using concur concurrency. Okay? And the, the idea is that I'm just going to run this inner dot product concurrently. And so much, how much work do I have to do? This is the amount of work I have to do. Okay, so First of all, I'm putting the inner body here into a, into a closure, this function here. And I'm launching this as a Go routine with the Go keyword. I have to pass in a bunch of parameters because while this thing is running, these values A, I, and J outside change because this Go routine is now off on its own, so I need to pass them in. So that's really launching the coroutine, and that's all that there is to be done to make this concurrent. But I also have to make sure that T1 
the out of function doesn't just return while all these coroutines are still running. So there's a little bit of machinery around it. Um, don't go too much into detail, but essentially I'm declaring here a weight group, which is a mechanism that allows me to wait on something. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to wait for m times m dot products. Okay. And the way I'm waiting for them is with this call here. And finally, inside the closure, every time I've done a dot product, I say done. Think of this like as a semaphore with a counter. So every time I'm done, the, this call wait group done signals to this group, okay, one less, one less. And eventually it will reach zero, and that's when the weight group weight here will uh, unblock and continue. So this program now does exactly the same thing as before, but it launches basically n times n routines and tries to run them all in concurrently or in parallel. Which of course they're not going to run concurrently. Oh, sorry, in parallel on my on my laptop because this is only like a I don't know two core machine, maybe with two hyper threads, so it's maybe four course um, but still so I ran this and I wrote a little program a little wrapper around it that multiplies first 10 by 10 20 by 20 and so forth up to a thousand by thousand matrices just as the matrix multiplication once in the very old way once as a dot product and once concurrently and that takes a little while because it has to compile and now it's running and you can see n is the size of the matrix there is, there is um, three results. Mal is the original schoolbook matrix multiplication. Mal fast is the same, but using a dot product. It's faster because you can uh, do fewer array bounds checks. It's faster because you can access the data in row major order. And then the last one is concurrent. And this is, of course, a toy. Uh, but you can see this five minute operation using some concurrency here reduced you know, the, the, the computation time by a factor of two even more. So for a thousand by thousand matrix, it's about twice as fast concurrently than not. And so that's pretty decent. So this is um, you know, one billion multiplications. This is not a super fast machine, uh, but it's kind of in the right ballpark, less than you know, a little bit more than half a second. Uh, and this is something, you know, literally takes you five minutes to do. There's no, there's almost no thinking about it. Yeah? Uh, is Go kind of noticing that it's uh, oversubscribing the, the processor so it doesn't really spawn a new OS thread? Yeah, so the, you, you really, so this program is really dumb. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm really launching, uh, what is it, a million coroutines here. And they're all waiting. And then, you know, there's probably four that can run simultaneously. So they're going to run, and then the next one is going to run, and the next one is going to go on, and so forth. So I could be much smarter, and I could, first of all, probably use a higher uh, granularity, not a single dot product, but maybe like, you know, 100 dot products. Uh, I could only launch four coroutines, reduce the overhead of the, of the coroutines, and so forth. But yeah, it, it just, Put some side. So those are actual threads. Pardon? They are actual threads. They are actually. Uh, they're not threads. They are the go routines are put onto threads. Okay. okay. Because if we would use threads, we could not launch a million. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Any other questions on this? So uh, the previous few slides, just I tried to give you a little bit of an idea of what's what's there in terms of language. Okay, uh, there's there's lots more to talk about, but I don't really have time to fill this talk just uh, with language details, and it probably would be uh, too boring. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the other aspects of the language. So I mentioned before, there's a standard library; it's very high quality. It also has this 1.0 guarantee that means. We're not going to make changes that are backward incompatible. We're making, we're making small changes uh, to fix things. We, we made a lot of changes in terms of performance and so forth. It's platform independent. It runs on a variety of machines. And uh, it contains the usual library stuff. 
that you would expect, but it also contains things that are not traditionally part of a standard library, such as tools to manipulate the language itself. So for instance, there's a, there's a complete uh, parser for Go programs, there's an abstract syntax tree as a library, uh, there's, there's tools to manipulate the abstract syntax tree, there's a printer which allows you to reprint it, and uh, there's a type checker that is not part of the compiler, it's outside, so it allows you to take a Go program and uh, type check it and then have that information to you available as, as a data structure. And so this has opened a whole new world of tools that people have written. The mo most notable, notable one is the one that was there from day one, which is GoFont, which is a formatter for Go software. And at this point, it's fair to say that probably 99.9% .9 of all Go code that's out there is formatted via GoFont. It's just a source code formatter, but it actually takes care of comments and it does a fairly decent job. So people have sort of converged on, on this style. And as a result, when you see Go code out there, it pretty much looks fairly uniform and you can read it. You don't have to get used to somebody else's uh, you know, ideas of where a curly brace should be and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna show quickly here the library. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. So this is the, this is sort of what is in the standard library right now. So you can see, I'm not gonna go into details, but just give you sort of an idea what there is. There's, there's you know, compression stuff, there's some containers, there's a lot of cryptography. It sometimes feels like the world is only about cryptography these days. Um, encoding stuff, then what I mentioned before, a lot of, a lot of libraries that have to do with the language itself, hashing, HTML, IO, some math stuff, a lot of networking, uh, including very strong HTTP support. In fact, part of the library is an HTTP server. If you wanted to write a simple HTTP server in Go, it takes about five lines of code. Um, you know, the usual stuff, operating system stuff, runtime stuff, string things and so forth. Uh, this is a standard library, but in the meantime, there's a, there's a slew of other libraries out there. Uh, Implementation-wise, so I mentioned this is compiled to C, statically linked by default, which is actually one of the reasons why Go is so successful, especially now, uh, where everything is being containerized or you know, put into the cloud, people really like that the binary is statically linked. There's just no deployment issue. You have your binary, you put it on the machine, and it runs. Uh, if you come from Java, it's a nightmare. You have to make sure that you have the right you know, JVM installed, the right libraries, the right flags, and so forth. Same with Python, same with a lot of other languages. So this is like, uh, this is just huge. Uh, it's a default. You can do some dynamic loading, uh, but that's the default. We have a, a runtime. It's a, it's a compiled yet garbage collected language, so we need a garbage collector. So there's a runtime that's automatically linked in. It also deals with uh, the scheduling of, of the core routines and so forth. We have three compilers. Command compile is the one that's the native, so to speak, compiler. It's written in Go now. Uh, but we have two others, GCC Go, which is an implementation of Go on top of GCC, and a more recent effort Go LLVM, which is based on LLVM, which is not that far uh, ahead. And it's supporting a lot of operating systems, and it's supporting a lot of uh, architectures. And it's fairly easy to do an import. So here I can show you the our actual, <coughs> honest to God, build page that you know where you can see what happens when you submit. So we tested on all these architectures and. At the top here, at the top here, you see you know, the, the various operating systems. So Darwin, FreeBSD, Linux, and so And then there's like it's probably hard to see here, 386, you know, uh, 64 <coughs> machines, and so forth. Then there's ARM, 
uh, ARM64, uh, there's even there's PowerPC, there's even an S3, uh, IBM 390 uh, that support it. And a lot of these ports actually have been done by the open source community. For instance, Window, the Windows port has com completely been done outside uh, our group, outside of Google, in fact. We have a lot of sub-repositories, -rep which are also being tested. Uh, whenever somebody does a commit, we can, uh, you know, we, we test on all these platforms, we run an extensive test suite. I briefly mentioned garbage collection before, so here is a, a quote. Uh, this is fairly recent because we just released 1.9. This is the release candidate 2. And um, this person, which is running a significant service, is using Go, and they see sub millisecond pauses. That's where the system stops for a heap that is 18 gigabytes, which is you know, fairly large. For, for uh, a web service. So other languages don't really get quite to these short uh, pauses. <clears throat> I mentioned two links, so we have a, a build system, so if you write your code all in Go, you actually don't need to write a make file or anything like that, you just say, you just point uh, your Go build tool into the directory where you are and say go build. And it will read all the files in that directory and it will automatically figure out the dependencies because in Go, dependencies are explicit. If you say, I'm importing this, then you've written down your dependency. And we have a somewhat canonical organization of directory structures which allows build tool to figure out where it needs to find uh, its dependencies. I mentioned GoFront. There's a documentation tool similar to Javadoc. Uh, there's a vet tool that checks a lot of things that the compiler maybe cannot check because it's not part of the language specification. For instance, did you provide all the arguments to a printf? Uh, did you provide the right types? And so forth. Did you shadow a variable that you were not supposed to shadow and things like that. But then there's a lot of other very interesting tools like a coverage analysis tool, which automatically checks whether your tests cover or how much they cover of your code. There's a race detector, which is enormously uh, useful. Uh, there's benchmarking uh, support and so forth. Here I can show you the GoFund briefly. This is the, play, the Go Playground, where you can write a piece of code and just run it on the web. You don't have to install anything. This is a piece of code showing the stringer example again, but it's not very well formatted, maybe a little bit hard to read. And so you can just click on, in this case, format, and you know, puts it into it, the canonical form. Uh, and, and of course, you can do this for large, large programs. It's just the easiest place to show it. Uh, and uh, you know, since we're here in the playground, you can also run this. Okay. Maybe, yeah. I'm going to go into details here. <clears throat> so, um, Clement, uh, so Michele asked me about things like interoperability. So, that's, uh, of course, if you have a heterogeneous system, which is uh, a lot of people have, you want to be interoperable with C. Now, Go is a garbage collected language, so there's always issues when you go across that boundary because you have pointers, etc. But uh, in Go, gar uh, pointers are not moving. The, the garbage collector is not a moving collector. So you can, in fact, pass Go pointers into C with some care, as long as you make sure that they stay alive while you're in C land. Uh, and the overhead is much less so than if you would use something like JNI in Java, where you actually have to go through a little dance, or JNI has to do a little dance to make sure uh, you get the pointer across. And then you have to use a handle. Um, the basic idea is this. In Go, there's a special sort of magic import, import C. And if you have an import C, all the commentary before the import C, immediately adjacent to that C, can be some 
form of stylized C code. And then you run it just to the ordinary Go compiler and it will automatically extract this. It will automatically construct uh, Go wrappers uh, and automatically do the right bindings and the linker will then connect it. And then you can call C DC functions as such. So you could say c.int func would for instance call um, this, uh, this thing. No, this is a cast, sorry. 42. So c.42 would for instance refer to this function. Okay. And then you cast it into this type and so forth. So you can do quite a, quite a bit with Seagull. And it's pretty efficient. You call functions that you haven't included in I mean, do you have to include all the C code in this little... Well, the typical, well, usually you wouldn't do it this way, you would include something. Because you write an include statement. Okay. And so, typically you'd have some header that's written somewhere else and you just include that header. Okay, so it's not like you have to write everything. But I mean, if your header included lots of C code and you had a huge library written in C and right. you had a few entry points that you wanted to call, right. that's okay, as long as you stick to a you know, limited uh, number of entry I, points. I believe that's okay, yes. Okay. So I, I, I have very limited experience myself with this API. I've done it and it works and I know there's a lot of people that, that use it and I'll, I'll, I'll get to some other examples. Yeah. What, what about the C++ group? So it's C. So the problem with C++ is that the, the, there is mangling of the names in C++ due to the typing. And so it gets more complicated. So um, you, as, long as, you ref, as long as you sort of interact with the C, C subset, so to speak, of C++, you're probably OK. Uh, but again, I, I'm, I'm not the, I, if this is something you'd be interested in, I can connect you with the person that written the code. I'm not very familiar with this. I've just not done it. Okay. So I mentioned in the beginning, scientific computation was not the primary goal. Uh, focus when we were working on Go. <clears throat> so there's no direct language support for things like this. There have been various proposals being made. In fact, there's a fairly active community that they call Gonam, Gonam people, uh, who have worked on various proposals. And they also have written fairly extensive libraries. And I mentioned a few of them here um, that you know, support some of the standard stuff like the, the Laypack uh, libraries and so forth, which can be accessed through these libraries from Go directly. And so these are essentially wrappers. There's even an MPI library, which I just found out. Uh, I've not looked at any of these, so people have started working on these kinds of things. <clears throat> so last but not least, um, you know, Go has become fairly big in the last few years. There is a lot of conferences at this point. Uh, there is, since 2014, there is a regular annual uh, Go conference in Denver, which uh, is called go for com and at this point attracts probably 1,500 people. I haven't been, here, been there this year, it's usually in July. Uh, there is a Go conference in China, uh, it was in <coughs> Shanghai in 2015, and I think in Beijing last year, uh, since it's a couple of months, there's a go for con in Singapore, which attracts all the people from the Southeast Asian uh, realm, which is exploding in terms of startups and, uh, and things like that. Uh, there's a regular conference in India, there's one in Brazil, and then there's various smaller ones like .go in Paris uh, and so forth. And there's a lot of uh, hang, um, hangouts, uh, meetups. So a lot of cities have regular meetups, there's one uh, in Zurich, I know, uh, it was just like a couple of weeks ago. And they usually meet like maybe once a month or so, people from the Go communi community, there's a short number of talks, maybe 20, 25 minutes, and uh, people can discuss uh, their, their, you know, their problems. Um, yeah, I mentioned that. So where are we going? Uh, so we have some near-term goals. One of the things that we hear from the community a lot from industry is we need to have better dependency management and versioning. 
Uh, that's a that's a big thing. We have some dependency management solutions, but versioning is not. There's not much there in terms of versioning. There's some outside tools, uh, but we are trying to consolidate a little bit. Uh, we are working on a new user experience, meaning our web page has now uh, been unchanged for several years and looks a little bit stale at this point. Probably needs to be, uh, we're in the process of revamping it. And we also are working on improving our community culture. Uh, as many of these projects um, have, a, have a little bit of a problem of not, being, of not feeling very inclusive, even though that was not really the case with Go. But um, uh, we're trying to get more diverse group of people into, you know, feel the welcome. And uh, as part of that, for instance, we launched a code of conduct a couple of years ago, which has been very successful. Uh, we have more women now that are contributing to Go. We want to have more you know, different people. <coughs> So that's kind of like a, uh, on the on the sort of outside, you know, face of things. Uh, internally, we're working on uh, faster compilation, better compilation, better code generation, you know, better libraries, and specifically, uh, go to. So in about what is it, 2019, in two years, Go has been open source for 10 years and has, as a language, not changed a whole lot. That's 10 years, and 10 years is a good sort of milestone after which it's probably uh, time to think about what we've learned, what we've done wrong, what should be improved. And so we call this Go2, the next generation of the language. And uh, it's not clear what's going on in there. Uh, we're trying to keep it simple. That's something that people like. Uh, but we're also trying to address some of the things that people are missing. And we're, uh, as a company, we are making a big push for Go as the language for the cloud. It's, it's very successful in the cloud, but we're trying to sort of ride that momentum and really make it the language for the cloud. Because a lot of the cloud systems that are out there are really based on Go. Okay, that's it. Hope that was helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to take questions and go into detail. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Robert. <laughs> that might perhaps eventually see the fruit of uh, the light of day. He might allocate some time and give you some time so that you can actually pursue it uh, as part of your day job. Okay, but it's not. It's not true that every, every Google engineer just automatically gets 20% time to do whatever they want. So the project started uh, with three people, eventually grew to five people. And the goal was really to find a replacement, not a replacement, sorry, a alternative to the C++ programming languages. C++ is the most commonly used programming language inside Google next to Java and then a whole slew of other languages. Um, and uh, many of us have been programming in C++ for lots of many, many years. I've, I've been programming in C++ for 10 plus years, and we were sort of tired and fed up with it. And we thought that there's, there must be better ways of doing things, especially in the 21st century. You know, the programming language should not be the problem. It should be the problem that you're trying to solve. So that's how Go started. Um, eventually, in 2009, it became an open source project. We open sourced it. Um, and in 2012, we froze it. And what that means is we decided that we're not going to change the language in any incompatible ways, and we're not going to change the libraries in any backward incompatible ways. It didn't mean we wouldn't change that. We wouldn't make small changes or fixes or add new stuff, but we would guarantee that whatever was there would always be there, at least for the foreseeable future. And that was really the, probably the most important decision once Go was out to actually freeze it. That's when all the other people outside in the world, companies, startups, etc., started to jump on the bandwagon and actually use it because they, they, they knew they could rely on it. <clears throat> and we've uh, been doing this ever since. Uh, we have now a semi-annual release cycle. And in fact, just uh, four days ago, we released uh, one version 1.9. 
So that's where we are now. Uh, Go 1.9 was released last week. Uh, if you look at some statistics that you can find on Stack Overflow, it's the uh, fifth most loved and third most wanted language. It's the number 14 on Stack Overflow in terms of languages used. It's number nine of languages on GitHub, and it's the second fastest growing. Uh, it's number nine in IEEE rankings. And we estimate between 500,000 to a million uh, users, programmers, but you know that's, that's really hard to uh, get a good, good grip, grip on this. And it's used all over the place. So obviously there's places like Google, but also IBM, Microsoft, Uber, Dell, all the big tech companies that you'd expect. Uh, but then also companies like the New York Times, BBC, and, but also Amazon, Walmart, and especially in China, it's one of the largest growing languages. Uh, we see companies like Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei, Baidu, etc., having large numbers of engineers, and you know, still small compared to the size of these companies, but definitely uh, significant numbers of engineers working in Go and actually doing products in Go that, that serve real traffic. So if you want to see a little bit more about where Go is in the world and where we are, I, I highly recommend this presentation, The State of the Go for Nation by Steve Francia. He gave that last week at the Go conference in uh, London. Uh, and it's a, much, it's, a, it's a little bit more fun and more, perhaps more sales-oriented presentation, but it gives you a very good idea of how Go uh, looks like in the world, where, where it stands in the world. So every, every you know, real project needs a gopher, and you know, I, I think, I don't know how many percent of the success we have to attribute to the gopher, but uh, this is our mascot, and this is the one version. It comes in a couple of other versions, very popular. And there's vinyl versions, and printed versions, and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about the technology. <coughs> so I talked, uh, about the, the language. So this is a general purpose programming language. It's uh, compact, concise, and readable. What do I mean by this? So compact, it's a small language. Uh, you can read the spec. That I really mean like the actual technical definition of the language in a couple of hours easily. It's quite readable. It doesn't feel like a you know, C++ reference. Uh, the language is concise. There's no public, static, void main. You just say function main or func main, that's it. And we put a lot of emphasis on readability. So code is most often read, more often read than written, and so we really want people to be able to read the code. And uh, you will see that there are some, some of the examples that it, more, it looks more like pseudocode than what you would maybe, or some people would consider like you know, software. Uh, it's a strongly typed language without the typing, so it's in the tradition of the strongly typed com uh, compiled languages, but you don't have to write a lot of type information down. In fact, most of I'm glad to, he to be here and uh, to present on Go uh, in my home country for once. Um, so this is a little bit of a semi-formal, more informal presentation. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask right away. Uh, it's also a presentation I've uh, put together over the last couple of weeks only, uh, and it's intended as, as a, an opening. So before I start, um, who of you has already heard of Go or never heard of Go? Let's start with who has never heard of Go? Okay, who has, who has uh, heard of Go and even written code in Go? One person, okay. Good, so I, I guess I should dive in a little bit more into details. So <clears throat> let's start with uh, a little bit of history. So what is Go? It's a programming language, it's not a board game. Uh, it comes with a lot of documentation. In the meantime, also lots of books. There is libraries and a lot of great tools. And most importantly, at this point, there's a very vibrant open source community. This is an open source project. It has started almost 10 years ago. In fact, uh, September 20th or 21st, I think we started 10 years ago. 
And uh, as Michele uh, alluded to, it's a 20% project, which is like this fabled concept that we have at Google where every engineer can take 20% of their time and do whatever they want, which is not really true. Uh, it's more like if you are burning to do something and you cannot be held back from doing that no matter what, even if you have a day job and you still do it at night, uh, and you can convince your manager that this is something the cases you don't have to write type information down at all and some of it is so deduced. It's a garbage collected language, but it doesn't have the pause times that usually are associated with garbage collected languages. And we've, our garbage collection team has made some enormous progress in that, in that space. And I'm talking here, uh, you know, sub millisecond pauses for very, very large heaps. And finally, it's a scalable and concurrent and efficient language. So the, this language was designed specifically for large-scale programming development. Uh, think Google, Google style. Uh, so there is an organization into packages. There's tools that uh, can deal with dependencies, dependency analysis. Uh, compilers are fast. It's a concurrent language. It's automatic. It supports concurrency in the language in a very, very simple way. And it's efficient, it's compiled to uh, machine code, it uh, runs on a variety of platforms, and it's probably best compared to C. It's, if you will, you can think of, of Go as a you know, modern C. Uh, syntactically, it has C tokens, so you, know, you see curly braces and things like that, but it has Pascal structure, so types are written from left to right as opposed to inside out. Which makes it, which makes them much easier to read. So I don't really have time to go into the details of the language, but I'm going to give you a bunch of examples that pick out some of the things that I think might be interesting to you. So here are a bunch of declarations. Every program in Go consists of essentially five declarations: import declarations, which are declarations of packages you 